I am more nervous today than I've ever been before a talk. Uh, what you're going to get is the first presentation of this presentation ever, and most likely the last. And because uh, I do have uh, incurable cancer, and I wanted to be here, and I wanted to try to think, what could I say, you know, that could make a difference? Uh, the frail elderly have been my focus all my career, in, entire career. And uh, I even took time out and got a nursing home administrator's license because <laughs> I wanted to be validated. <laughs> so, uh, I want to tell you this story. Uh, I got to get over my nervousness, though, which is very unusual, as you probably know. So I'm going to tell a story about it. It will help you. Some of you have heard this before, probably Stephanie and I know Bob. Uh, I had this friend with Southwest Airlines. And uh, I was talking to him, and he was, he's the director of, he was then, the director of fun. And I think that's why Southwest Airlines is so successful is because they have a director of fun. And uh, he gave a talk once, and uh, I was telling him how nervous I sometimes get, and he said, David, it's easy. If you get nervous right before they introduce you, go to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and say, hey, it's going to be good. It's going to be OK. It's going to be all right. And then go out and give your talk. I said, thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. And. Uh, <laughs> kind of forgot about it until I was in Wisconsin, matter of fact, Madison. 600 uh, people at this uh, luncheon, and I've been invited to be a guest speaker, and, and uh, they're volunteers, and I'm nervous. And this uh, host, hostess comes up and says, uh, David, uh, are you ready? And I said, well, uh, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I go down and, you know, and I decide, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. So I walk down the bathroom, and I walk in, and I think it's empty. <laughs> so I look at the mirror, and I thought, I'm going to do this. And out loud, because, you know, I thought I was the only one there. And I looked in the mirror, and I said, you know, not knowing how to do this, I said, OK. Uh, Hey! No. Hey! <laughs> uh, this is going to be good. This is going to be okay. This is going to be all right. And just at that moment, this guy flushes his toilet <laughs> in the stool, out in the stall. And he, uh, and I'm frozen. I'm just frozen. He walks out of the stall and he walks behind me and he says, I hope it is. <laughs> And I know he thought I was getting ready to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I did this little bit. Remember, Chris? I said, I got to go to the bathroom. I did it. Except I do it real quick these days. So, hey. <laughs> so you can use that. And uh, so I give you that gift. It might be the best takeaway. <laughs> so I'm thinking, uh, what can I say? It might make a difference. So I titled this, uh, you know, it's possible I could die in a nursing home. I was raised in a, actually one point, four generation family. Um, my great aunt was first, she died in my arms in a nursing home. Then my grandmother died in my arms at age 99. The nursing home, I was closest to her. I'm sorry, my grandfather was first. And I was with him when he died, then my great aunt. No, my great aunt, then my grandfather, then my grandmother, same thing, and my mother in my own facility, so to speak, at Heartland Health System. I was executive vice president in charge of all the chronic care services. And uh, so, you know, I've seen people die, and I've been around a lot of it, and so have you. And, uh, and it could be that I could end up in your home. And so I began to think, what is it I can tell you? And from my perspective now, you know, what I want you, what do I really want you to know about me? So I've given this some serious thought. 
And uh, what I'm going to share with you is not in a book in many places. It's parts of it, maybe. Um, maybe not. And maybe it's useful. And for maybe two or three of these things I'm going to share with you, there are solutions. But for most of them, there aren't, because they haven't been solved. And so I think my challenge is think about them. Because if you can solve these, you can take care of me. And a lot of people uh, like me. So I began to think, you know, how can I get into this? And um, so I thought of another context in my life. You do a lot of life review when you're facing the end of it. And um, I've been sober for 28 years. Uh, I quit drinking 28 years ago. That's 1984. I didn't quit for any moral reasons, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> AA, uh, AA saw, saved my life, really. And uh, at AA, you're not supposed to talk too much about it, but I'm going to tell you that when you have a newcomer to an AA meeting, everybody, if they know it's a newcomer, everyone in the group knows that they're going to say three things that meeting. They're going to say how it was, what happened, and how is it now? And everybody can tell you that story. Any alcoholic can tell you that story, recovering alcoholic. And so I thought maybe I can use that kind of format here today. So I'm going to tell you uh, what it was like, uh, a little bit about, very quick, not a lot, about my own career and in getting into this business of caring for the frail elderly. And then I want to share with you what happened, and, and that's the cancer diagnosis. And, I, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, and already here at this meeting, uh, several of you, almost, I don't think there's a person in this room probably isn't affected in some way by this cunning, baffling disease, cancer, uh, whether it's in your family or friends or colleagues at work. Uh, it's the second leading cause of death, and it's an insidious thing, and it's very expensive to cure, and then it not cure. And so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey and uh, what that has taught me uh, that might be helpful. I don't think if that hadn't have happened, <sighs> that I could put this together. You're not to cry. <laughs> okay. And I'm not either, okay? I can get through this. Uh, Forty years ago or so, I get this PhD. Had a lot of formal education. And uh, boy, I thought I was the smartest kid that ever walked the face of the earth. I would thought I was God's gift to aging. Because uh, had this PhD in sociology with a minor in gerontology, one of the first. And I was part of this inter-university training program where people from all over the country got together and learned about this new discipline, aging. And this was in the 60s. And I loved those times. Uh, we had good times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were really good. And so, you know, people in my own family that reared me, uh, you know, got old. And so I get this phone call, at, uh, actually still at the University of Missouri finishing up. And my grandmother said, uh, uh, David Aunt Patty's dying. Uh, she's in a nursing home. I said, how come I didn't know this? How long has she been in the nursing home? Well, she's been there about a year. <laughs> oh. And uh, we just are at wits and don't know how to communicate with her. And you got all this education. And uh, we'd like for you to come down and and teach us, uh, help us with Aunt Patty. I'll do it. I mean, you know, I am the superhero. <laughs> I am ready to spring into action to save the day. And I was young then. Uh, this would have been 1968. <coughs> I won't tell you how young I was. But I was actually, uh, figured that out anyway, in the 20s, and uh, I drive right to the nursing home. 
and I had not been in many nursing homes up to that point, if any. And so I parked the car, and I walk into the nursing home. This nursing home was the kind where uh, everyone gathered at the front door, you know. You know, our residents gather where the action is, right? And whether it's at the nurse's station or at the elevators, if it's a high rise, or, you know, or some other space, but they, they're, they're right there. And a lot of old nursing homes are like that. You walk in, boom, there you are. And uh, I guess I wasn't ready for what I call now the gauntlet, you know, where everybody has their line, you're in the lineup, you know what I mean? They're lined up there. And uh, you walk in and I must have done what most families do that have rarely been into a home. I walked in and I went, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to catch that on film. Huh? People just aren't prepared for it. And I call it the gauntlet because, you know, you start down through there and every now and then an arm comes out, you know. Hey! Hey, but would you talk to me? You know, right? Yeah. Right? Yes. yes. Talk to me, buddy. Hey, I, I'd like to listen to my story. Hey! Hey, where are you going? Hey, to hell with you. <laughs> and wait for the next one. And you know, a lot don't have this ability and, and so they'll scoot the chair out in front of you and block your path. You ever had your path blocked, right? And if they can't do that, they do it with their eyes. And that's the killer. You know, you walk it in and you make the mistake of looking at them. And they're screaming silently, come talk to me. And you, and you do, you know, you finally, I did that once, I walked up and I thought I was gonna be there three hours. And I got down on my knee, which is worse. I said, what is it? She said, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Nurse, this person needs to go to the bathroom. Okay, took 10 seconds. But where was I? Well, I made it through the gall and made it back to my aunt's room and there she was skill care. She had Alzheimer's disease, what then they called organic brain syndrome. We know it was Alzheimer's. Advanced. She had no idea who I was. This is my first experience with dementia in general and Alzheimer's in particular. And you know, I go up to her and, and Patty, it's David. David. No. Boy, these flowers are pretty. Look at the nice view you have here. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. I tried a few other things. I stayed maybe seven or eight minutes and left. I got to the car and I just sat there. And I thought, man, David, you've got a disease called PhD-itis. <laughs> you think you know everything. You don't know anything about aging and particularly the frail elderly. And I uh, decided right then and there I had to figure out how to get over this uncomfortableness that everyone experiences. Everyone. Neither me nor any of you in this room went to school saying, I want to be a nursing home administrator. <laughs> I don't think. Or I want to work in a nursing home. I want to be a director of nurses. I want to be an MDS coordinator. <laughs> 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 And goody, I can start out as a CNA. <laughs> Not any of us. And so I, I decided, what am I going to do? So I started teaching this course called The World of Nursing Homes. And I taught it for 18 years. And my students and myself spent long hours in wheelchairs, in jerry chairs, ate the pureed food. I started spending the night and 
But Sally Terman wrote a book about all those experiences in 1988 called uh, The Human Factor in Nursing Home Care. And uh, I got comfortable about the third day in a nursing home where I decided to spend the night. Uh, because I went in and no one knew that uh, I was not a patient, a resident. And so um, they had my room number, they had a chart, full care, you know, total, total care. Uh, three o'clock in the morning, everyone flushes toilets, I tell you that, I learned a lot. Six o'clock in the morning, the nurse's aides come in and uh, said, well, honey, are you ready for your bath? And I'm thinking, I'm clean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, bath? And it didn't, you know, they weren't waiting for any kind of answer. And uh, they were pulling the sheets off the bed. They transferred me into the wheelchair. They threw a sheet over my head. I felt like a, you know, Ku Klux Klan, you know, person. I had this sheet over me and then they're wheeling me down the corridor on the way to what I now call the chamber. <laughs> and back then, they did not have the walk-in whirlpool baths, okay? Back then, they had the whirlpool lifts, chair lifts. And uh, that's where, you know, a chair is on a hydraulic pole, got it? And the water's behind. And the first thing they did was to take all my clothes off, which didn't, wasn't much. It was just a little sheet and a gown. And I'm naked, and they put me on this cold plastic chair. It was February. And this nurse's aide steps back and hits the button. And boy, up I go. And I'm up there, and she pauses, and she stands back, and she says, you know, I wonder why more people don't use this. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. I'm 10 feet off the floor. My head's about to go through the ceiling. I'm naked as a jaybird, and you're looking at my privates. And with that, she hits the button. <laughs> got over the water and down. And then threw the wash rag and said, wash yourself. <laughs> and I did. And somehow, after that, I was comfortable in nursing homes and have been ever since. And uh, I've been at it and loved it. And uh, for one year, I actually was an assistant administrator in a nursing home. That was fun. And I've had the luxury of uh, being associated with Bob. And I met Bob in 1974. So we go way back. And uh, it was in the American College of Nursing Home Administrators. And I traveled, thanks to Bob and others, and gave talks in about 26 different states. Advocate mostly for CNAs. I'm a huge advocate for CNAs. But I won't go into that. And even at the university uh, in the Department of Family Medicine, I have some fourth-year residents who wanted to uh, learn more about the nursing home, and I said, well, you're going to have to spend a day in a wheelchair. Really? <laughs> and I've had them in nursing homes uh, even as recently as last year. And I'd always go up behind them, you know, and when they didn't know it, and would pull the wheelchair back. <laughs> and they would scream, and uh, I said, you don't want to ever do that. <laughs> Most of those residents, physicians, thanked me at the end and said, you know, thank you, David, I know that I never want to work in nursing homes ever again. It's tough work. It's really tough. I agree what Joy said this morning. I have the utmost respect for all of you who do this important work. So, uh, September the 14th, I uh, went in for uh, sh steroid shots in both knees. I've got bone against bone. And this is to put off uh, knee replacements. And uh, it's worked. 
50% of the people that do this, it works. For me, it works. And uh, I get shots every three or four months. And so it's just that regular routine uh, appointment with the primary care doc, who is also my best friend and also the chair of the Department of Family Medicine. And he, uh, he gave me my shots and I said, Steve, I've been shaving now for about two months and I've been this little growth here. I, you can't really see it, but I, I know it's there because every morning I, my razor goes over it. And I thought it was just some scar tissue from a previous surgery, but what do you think? You want to, what do you, look at that. And he did his thing and he said, yeah, David, I think you've got two swollen uh, lymph nodes. I said, is that serious? He said, well, you know, lymph nodes get swollen. We'll do a CAT, CAT scan, we'll look at them. Did a CAT scan and did uh, some x-rays and sure enough, there were not two, but there were five. Uh, lymph nodes that were very swollen. And I knew then that something was up. Uh, nothing was definitive, but I knew something was up because all these physicians around whom I work and tease and have fun and they're good friends, they kind of quit teasing and there wasn't as much fun. And it's like they know something I don't know. Uh, they suspect something. So we did a needle biopsy and um, uh, that did, was not definitive. And then we did an open biopsy uh, where they went in and took one of the lymph nodes out and sure enough it had metastasized to the lymph nodes and it was cancer for sure, fast uh, squamous, fast growing cancer cells. Still did not know uh, the source or to where if it, or if it had spread, where or if. And so, um, Two days later, I uh, had a PET scan, and uh, sure enough, uh, they found uh, right behind my nose a little tumor. Uh, they call this nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and it had metastasized to the lymph nodes and then to the bone, uh, stage four. And when I heard stage four, my knees started shaking because that's, the, that's worse than the word cancer these days, because it really means not curable. And uh, I thought, stage four, yeah, and uh, so we'll, uh, we'll start chemo and radiation, maybe both real soon. And I said, well, I will see about that. Um, I just want you to know you may be the quarterback, but I'm the coach. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got a second opinion. and who suggested that I do the chemotherapy, not the radiation, because the radiation would have taken half of my face off and, and my uh, vocal cords. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> so I opted out for the chemotherapy. And um, so I need to tell you that the, and I was gonna fight this thing. It's gonna be a fight, a war. Uh, my daughter helped me with uh, website called David versus Cancer. We had it all ready to go. And for four days, I was going to do that. And uh, my doc, my good, good friend physician, his father, who's 92, is a very good friend and had given instructions four days previous for me to call him. And I'd put it off. And finally, I called him, and he said, about time you called. You got a pencil? <laughs> Absolutely. Four things. Don't panic. Two, don't struggle. Don't fight it. Three, relax. Four, accept it. It is what it is. None of us get out of this alive. Oh, thanks, Fred. <laughs> but it was a huge relief to think that I'm not going to fight this. And I began to think if there ever was a teachable moment, this is it. I've been a teacher all my life. And I can teach people about this cancer, and I can teach people how to die, at least the way I do it. And uh, 
I got excited about that, all right? And so I um, went to my physician. I said, Steve, now how do I tell others? Because that's the first question you ask yourself. How do you tell others that you're dying? You know, that is a, you know, I worried more about that than anything. And he said, I don't know, David, you're a pretty creative guy. You're going to have to do it in your own way, but I will tell you this. And if you go up to someone and they know you have cancer, but they don't know if you know that they know that you have cancer, it's going to be an awkward conversation and maybe no conversation at all. So you can count on that. I said, well, thanks. So I decided to produce a video. By the way, I put a bunch of handouts of these slides I'm eventually will get to <laughs> on the table back there. And on the back page is a, is a blog reference that we can type in if you haven't done it. Several of you have. And all the videos that I've produced since this first one is, uh, are, the, are posted on there. And uh, they're really my experiences in teaching about this cancer. But the first video, or any of them, never, the intention was never to inspire anyone. I just wanted to tell the faculty members and family medicine about my diagnosis, because when you get this diagnosis, your life turns upside down. I had to get out of all my voluntary organizations that I was uh, very active in, and uh, in the doctor's visits and PET scans and chemo treatments and uh, blood transfusions, and I could just go through them, and fluids, uh, and then you get symptoms and rush to the hospital. In the month of February, and the treatment started in October, in the month of February, I was uh, home only eight days out of that whole month. And these chemo, from my case, 21 days between treatments. There were six of them, and uh, they get accumulatively worse. They don't tell you that. Um, my second opinion guy, who's an old buddy, a real good buddy, <laughs> <laughs> told me that um, just take 0.9. After your first chemo treatment, you're going to be 90% of yourself. After the second one, multiply again by 0.9, and you're going to be 80% of yourself and keep doing it. So by the time I got to my sixth treatment, there's no surprise that I was needing blood transfusions because I was 48% or so of myself. That's when Bob visited. <laughs> uh, so uh, I decided I needed to teach about this, and I, and I did these videos, and I'd done four or five of them. And Associated Press reporter, uh, before I started recording, the third and the fourth. No, he'd seen the third one. Uh, he had seen an article that had been done by the Mizzou uh, online newsletter and he magazine, and he uh, said, "I'd like to talk to you." It was the day after Christmas, and uh, I had coffee with him, and he said, "I want to do a story on you, if that's okay." Uh, most people aren't open and candid like you are, and uh, they tend to withdraw and disengage and crawl into a cave or else they are fighters and aggressively try to do everything possible to save themselves. But you're taking a little different approach. I'd like to follow you. So he followed me for two months. Then he wrote a story and that went viral. It went to the Huffington Post and every major newspaper in the United States and, and worldwide. And so CBS uh, contacted me at the CBS This Morning show with Charlie Rose, and they flew my wife and I to New York to uh, film a live show, and I have a clip from it, uh, which I'm really showing shamelessly, because it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and also because it shows some clips of some of the videos that we did, and then a brief interview that, uh, you know, you're not on there long. Yeah. And so I'll, uh, it tells you more, and then I'll get on with uh, this presentation.
discovery they have a terminal illness. I'll tell you what my 92-year-old mother told me. This was going to be a war for me, David versus cancer, a battle. And uh, that would have been a terrific waste of time. Uh, instead, he said, don't panic, uh, don't struggle, relax, and accept it. It is what it is. You know, none of us get out of this alive. And so I, instead of wasting my time trying to battle this silent killer, I decided to, uh, you know, it's a time to teach. If there ever was a time to teach, this is it. So you have another purpose in your life then? Yeah. I do. I do. And there's no shortage of topics that you can do videos on. And the response from people all over the United States and uh, seven different countries now. Uh, what do they say? They say, uh, I have a friend. And I didn't know about that 21 day, what happens between chemotherapy, or I have a caregiver and they're going through exactly what your wife's going through, or I have cancer and my doctor told me over the telephone for crying out loud. Uh, and the stories just uh, tear you apart. The people that sometimes just aren't getting all the information they need about what's going on in their bodies. Good for you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. The University of Virginia is still shaken, remembering a promising lacrosse player. So, by the way, there were 10,000 hits on the blog in 24 hours after that show. The blog now has 38,000 hits, and um, we're just overwhelmed by that from 74 different countries. It's. Uh, this cancer thing is more than my story. It's a much bigger thing. And this last stage, uh, what I said there, um, is true. Um, my wife, I was telling Karen last night, and she also, you know, when you're in hospice, you see the end stage. Uh, the last month, last two months. Uh, CNAs, you know, are the best predictors of when someone's dying. They, they have that look about them. Is the phrase, as you know. And the, uh, so I've seen it, and I know what it's like, and I know the, right? And the breaths are, get down to two or three a minute, and I do think about that. I'm not fearful of it, but I worry about the caregivers and whether I'll have enough painkiller to uh, take care of my pain. And so I've decided, well, what if I end up in a nursing home this last month or two? Because it will happen. And that led to what I wanted to share with you. And I share it honestly and with respect. And, and uh, I don't know, I'm going to share these concerns, what I want you to know about me. And, and, then, and then later, I'll tell you just a few <coughs> solutions, maybe but you're going to have to use your imaginations for some of them. I worry about pain. And maybe that's because of my profession. And I know that most physicians are poor, uh, are poor when it comes to knowing how to manage pain. Right, Karen? Complete the fifth, yes. Huh? Yes. Yes. And uh, certainly, most nursing home uh, employees aren't prepared. And especially when you come across a dementia patient, you don't know what's pain and what isn't. And often if it's pain, they don't know how to tell you. And they live in pain. It is uh, a serious deal. And um, I really uh, think about that a lot. Uh, I was asked, I don't know if you've seen the award-winning uh, uh, movie How to Die in Oregon. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go there and establish residency in time. <laughs> uh, they have what people call assisted suicide there, legal, legal euthanasia, if you're not aware of that. Two doctors sign orders, and there's a potion that's mixed up. I think it's advanced Ativan. And uh, you, go, you swallow it, just about a cup or so. And in about a minute, uh, you go into a coma, or quietly. And then uh, several minutes later, you're dead. My mother died of cancer in my arms. Of, and if I had had a potion to give her, I would have. 21 days of hell, 
cancer of the lungs spread to the brain. It was horrible. And she basically died because she didn't drink or eat anything. What a way to go. My father committed suicide. He had throat cancer. And suicide is also a, a way some people deal with this. And it has a lot to do with pain. Pain needs to be managed. Um, and uh, my wife, also being in hospice, has told me that with few exceptions, and there are one or two, but with few exceptions, there's no reason why anyone in America should have pain. No reason at all. But we're not uh, trained to do that. I do have, uh, in Missouri, uh, we don't have uh, the nice uh, things they have in Colorado and uh, Oregon legal <laughs> <laughs> marijuana for a 60s guy. But I have two very close friends. And <laughs> one is a PhD. <laughs> and they have safe stashes. <laughs> One of them recently said, I said, you know, I haven't had it in 40 years, but I think I may be ready one of these days. And he said, you can come over anytime <laughs> and get reacquainted. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Um, and so uh, I worry about pain. Um, and so I'll just, that's number one. It's the easiest solution of all these, by the way, when I get to it. <coughs> Strangers. You know, this doesn't come up in many presentations. Pain does. But not this. Roommates don't make close personal friends. You overcrowd a rat cage and you're going to have a lot of death just from fighting. It's a man in Kansas who murdered his roommate. And when asked, why did you murder your roommate? He said he talked too much. Jeez. <laughs> man, I could have been that dead man. <laughs> and uh, uh, then there was a, another one who uh, told me once, said, you know, I can't wait until he dies. And I said, why, why would you say that about your roommate? And he said, well, I want the window. <laughs> See, he had the bed, the one button window. Woo. <laughs> Social relationships, a lot of you have heard me talk about how that is what makes life a drama. When your life world intersects somebody else's life world and some kind of magic happens from it, you know? Yes! Woo! You felt like that lately? In the last year? <laughs> Five years. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often, actually. Where you internalize someone else with respect and they listen to your story, listen, and you listen to theirs. And you really have a meaningful encounter. And the longer and longer you live, you lose them because they die. And these close friends and these confidants who may have made life such a drama, who knew all your garbage, all of it, all your secrets, and still loved you. Can you imagine that? When they die. Now, no one knows your story. kind of death is that? I, I don't see a lot of people laughing and smiling, you know, in nursing homes all my career. There are exceptions, and there are singers. Not many smiles. And that does have something to do with the generations that we learned about a couple days ago. People who take themselves too seriously, by the way, make me nervous. Okay. And I try not to do that with me. I think the silver chair presentation we had here and families and the communication, we need to do that with friends as well. <laughs> Open 
tighten it up. This new generation is into Facebook and social networking and and can uh, and are used to communicating uh, via tele video methods. And we better be fully equipped because in my nursing home, I want a huge screen where I can see my friend up close and personal, and of course, porn. <laughs> Food. Uh, who's a Mary? Tell us, Novak, Mary? Nayak. Nayak. Uh, former board member, Wish. Head of what? InterServe? My inner? My inter Not the head of. She works for Work for us. Yeah. And what was the name of it? My, my, inter my interview. interview. Yeah, my interview. Her research shows nationally that uh, family members and uh, residents up to a third have real serious complaints about the dining experience and food and collectively. It's a serious deal. I was pretty excited the other day when the cow came in and clanged the bell. And I thought, well, that could be fun. <laughs> and might cause a few smiles. It did me. It actually scared the hell out of me because it came out <laughs> the door. <laughs> but you know, you take a 60-bed nursing home, three meals a day, that's 180 meals a month and 5,400, no, 180 meals a day, 5,400 a month and 64,800 a year, just in a 60-bed nursing home. And the way a lot of us do it, there's all this pre-time, getting them there, the parade, and then waiting and then eating, and then waiting, and then going back. Could be two hours each meal. Six hours out of the day. I want to be able to eat when I want to eat, where I want to eat, and, and uh, even if I don't wish to eat at all. And I want it to be like on a cruise ship. That's the hardest one to fix, the most difficult one, because it requires so much imagination of restructuring of so many things to make that happen. But it's important. Six hours out of my day, think about it. Meal time is a special time. It's not a nutritional event, <coughs> okay? It's a social event. And the more money you spend at the restaurant, the longer you stay. Have you noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> and the fellowship is what lives forever. I had a great meal with a lot of friends last night, and, and I will remember the, the food a little bit. It was really good but I'll remember the fellowship much longer. Our kids, I have five kids, two from uh, first marriage and three from another. The, other, the three of girls have called me daddy for 17 years. And uh, I've always had them from age five on to turn off the TV, everything. And we had at least one meal every day together whether it was at a restaurant or at home. And uh, we had great times. It was a so every meal, social event. And they always waited for my question, OK, what was the highlight of the day? And they'd all start talking at once. It was great. I will miss that. Escaping. Trust me. <laughs> if I'm in your home, I am an escape risk. <laughs> you will redefine restraints. <laughs> when and how to use them. Uh, and I want to go where I want to go and do what I want to do and 
go in every restricted area possible and sneak out of your place as much as I can. <laughs> as long as I have my wits, I will celebrate each time I make it. <laughs> and if you can't find me, I'll come back and say, see, I got out, you didn't find me. <laughs> You get claustrophobic, <laughs> and uh, not to be able to see a pasture or a field or a stream or a mountaintop ever again would be really tough. I was a consultant on building a nursing home in Tucson, outside 60 miles outside Tucson, Arizona, on an Indian reservation. The, the Hoda Odom Indian Reservation, they have all this casino money, and after they build a school and a police station, a lot of other things, they finally decided they had a lot of money left over and they should build a world-class nursing home. And I was fortunate enough to be on the consulting team, the feasibility team, to put that together. And uh, my job, one of them, I made seven or eight trips out there, got to know the Native Americans really well, and. So I went into Tucson where the Indians uh, went uh, for nursing home care. And it was one of two nursing homes and one in particular, and that's the one I went to. And because of the diet in Pima County and, and the uh, diabetics and the and, uh, horrible uh, conditions there, that uh, over half of them had amputations. And they had to wheel them in this room and none of these elderly people spoke English, zero. And I had a translator who was a, a healer, a medicine doctor, if you will. And uh, he was a great guy. And he helped translate for me. And I asked them, we're going to build this nursing home out here on the reservation. Where do you want it and what do you want to have in it? And they all just just overwhelmingly said, we want to see our sacred mountain every day. Okay, that's most important to us. And we want to be able to sit out on the patio and feel the breeze. <coughs> Make that happen for us, we'll be happy. And boy, we did. <laughs> if you're ever out on that Indian reservation, I've been there three times since it's built. It is world class. That casino money, every time you gamble, just think, hey, this is going to help somebody. <laughs> because you'll probably lose a lot. And they have all this open window. And there's their sacred mountain, and I forget the name of it. I should, surely should remember. And there's a large patio. And they have, it's really great. I would go to Arizona, but they don't have marijuana laws. <laughs> the nursing home in Columbia, Missouri, there was a Red Hat Society, right? You know the Red the Nursing home decided they had to cut the transportation budget, and the Red Hats didn't get to go out to their restaurant in the community. And I had gone with them previously on their outing, one of the outings. Oh my god, it hoot. It was so much fun, and it was, they, ah, talk about a lie. These ladies, by golly, and they talk dirty. It was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> they lost that transportation. They lost all that fellowship. And they lost part of their lives as a result. Let's kind of combine what I just said. Um, and a lot of church members, including myself, would visit him in the beginning of his stay. And like everybody else, you tend to forget, you know? And I felt guilty because every time I drove home, I drove by that nursing home and I could even see Dawson there in the lineup in that nursing home. And I knew I could load him up, I thought, in my car and take him out for a ride. And one day, the guilt got me so much. I went through, got into that nursing home, made it through the gauntlet, 
got to Dawson, found him, said, Dawson, it's David. Where have you been? You know, that didn't help my guilt. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, Dawson. I just, I just, you know, forgot about you. <laughs> well, that's a hell of a note. And I said, well, you want to get out of here? What? You want to get out of here? God, let me take you for a ride. I'll take you out to your farm. Can you get it? Can you leave? He said, I, I don't think so. I don't think they'll let me out of here. And you're not family. I said, they won't know that. And uh, yes. And so I went and said, I would like to take Dawson Trimble out for a ride. And they said, who are you? And I said, I'm his minister. <laughs> they never ask for a card. <laughs> Works every time. <laughs> oh, sure, that's just wonderful. You know? <laughs> so I sign him out, and we go out. And we have a great time. And I won't go into the... Took him to a car wash. Scared the shit out of him. <laughs> took him to a bank through the window and took him out to his farm. We sat there and I had to watch him tear up. That was tough. But he loved it and I waited until he had enough. And then we're driving back and he said, uh, I said, is there anywhere else you want to go, Dawson? He said, yeah, the grocery store. I said, all right. So we go to the grocery store. Now that was, you know, getting the wheelchair out, that's a lot of trouble. And I'm wheeling him down the aisle. Some old uh, civic organization friends saw him and looking at him like, like, I didn't know you were alive. Hi, Dawson. I, well, uh, well, and of course, self-righteously, I'm standing there smiling. You know. <laughs> so what do you want, Dawson? He says, cookies. Oreo cookies. OK. So he gets these cookies. He gets them. I get them off the shelf. And he hides them under his blanket. I think, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we may be in trouble here. <laughs> I said, Dawson, you're going to have to put those on top of the blanket. We do have to pay for them. But his hiding them was a clue. We get the cookies. We check out. I get him back to the nursing home, and he's quiet. And I, and I think maybe he's sad. And I'm going back. I said, Dawson, uh, sorry i got to bring you back to the nursing home. Uh, and then it hit me. I said, Dawson. You're not supposed to have the cookies, are you? <laughs> he said, no. Well, I said, I, I guess that means we'll have to sneak them in. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and we did. It was great. We hid those little devils, and we got in there, got back to his room, and immediately wheels over to the chest is hiding them in his drawer. You know how you find them under the underwear. Yeah. With ants all over them. And you know, I'm proud that I did that, by the way. <laughs> I got ready to go, and, I, and this ties into what I said earlier. I said, Dawson, I'm sorry, I'll try to come back more often. And I did, by the way. And I've had as much fun today as I've ever had. And he said, thanks, David. And he started to, uh, oh, and I said, and I know what to bring next time. I'll bring some cookies. And he started crying, and this is a man who's very tough German type, and he, not a crier, and so it's kind of tough being there with him as he did this, and, uh, and through the tears, I just let him cry, and he finally said, D I, don't, I don't want the cookies. I just want you. Just want you. He said, it's been the greatest day since I've been here. Got him out of the home. It was a great day. <laughs> he says, if I'm able to masturbate, I want to, if I'm able. I can carry it. <coughs> Last uh, year, when were we, were we in Sonoma? Was that? Yes. When was it? Just Fall? a year ago. This yeah. year? Just a year ago. Uh, I did a, a program on sexuality and intimacy. How many were there? <laughs> yeah. How things going? <laughs> uh -huh. 
in that I, I pointed out, I uh, gave you all those statistics, and one of the most interesting ones to me was that 55% of uh, men over 65 masturbate and 55% of women over 65 masturbate whether they have a partner or not. A lot of tension relief, you know, pretty therapeutic, and yet, and pretty serious stuff. I will tell you a horrible thing I might have done, although it's very consistent with my personality. <laughs> <laughs> After my third chemo treatment, uh, you see, the, in these 21 days between treatments, the, the last four days in these 21 days, you feel pretty good because you're recovering from the treatment itself. And there's, you have those moments of good, I mean, it's really, you, you feel, you think you'd rather be dead there in the middle and, and for about two weeks, but, uh, first four days when you're on steroids and you feel you can climb mountains, that's great. And the last four days are really good in the first four or five treatments. And so after the third treatment, we're down and we took advantage of those times. And we still take advantage of every day. And I urge you to. We went to Las Vegas and Tucson and on a four-day cruise two times. And uh, a good time. We, we've had made value use that time. Well, the third time we're down in Tucson and I said, I'm going to call my medical oncologist. He's a fourth year fellow and I kind of like him, and, but he's so formal. He's an Indian, you know, and yes, yes, Dr. Oliver, yes, you know, and very good, answers all my questions, very sharp, but very formal. I, I, that makes me nervous. <laughs> I like people who'd be far more human than that. So here I am in Tucson, I called him up and I said, I got him on the phone, I called him by his first name. That always, I think, bothered him too. I said, Robbie, it's David, I'm down in Tucson, Arizona. Should I go buy some condoms? Silence. <laughs> this is great. I said, I said, Robbie, you there? <laughs> I said, you know, I got these nasty chemicals in my body and I don't want to put those in my woman. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what, the, what they'll do to her? I haven't bought condoms in a long time. I'm a little nervous about it, but I think maybe I better go get some because I think things are, might happen tonight. <laughs> I brought some Viagra to make sure. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> and finally, he says, uh, d uh, uh, d uh, d uh, David, you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> so what do you mean I'm okay? He said, um, that's really, if, if, uh, if Debbie was 24 years old and if she were pregnant, it'd be a serious problem. Or, but, but you're not. And uh, I think you're just fine. I said, well, I think we ought to include this in patient education time. <laughs> and I made him as nervous as I could. <laughs> he no longer holds his arms this way <laughs> with me. And I think I've contributed a lot to his professional career. <laughs> sexuality is important. Intimacy is important. It's not just social, emotional. It's it's physical and it's all of that that we've all experienced and enjoy and uh, makes life a drama too. And to, and to think that an elderly person uh, can't enjoy that is a huge mistake, which is why I did that presentation, you know, out in California. So I want privacy. That means you got to train your staff. And I told you the story out in California. The nurse's aide came in, slapped a man who was, no, a woman, a woman who was masturbating. Told her she's going to hell and some crazy religious bullshit. And, and uh, big mistake. <laughs> Her son was one of the leading attorneys in San Antonio. And she was very alert and very open and very liberal. And seeing, that CNA was fired that day. Um, one of my students found her working somewhere else in another nurse home three weeks later. 
I'm in your home, don't slap my hand. <laughs> or whatever else I'm in. <laughs> Boredom. I really worry about being bored. When I took my grandmother in to admit her to a nursing home, by the way, you need to know my grandmother's like Sophia on Golden Girls and explains a whole lot about me because it was my grandmother that reared me. And she, even though my mother was in the home, I was closest to my grandmother. She always listened to my story, regardless of how gruesome and horrible it might be. And I listened to hers. We were close. And uh, she was fun. You'd, she, at age 90, she had a little stroke, went in the emergency room, and these paramedics were trying to take out her teeth. She was always proud of the fact that she always had her own teeth. But here they are, trying to take them out. <laughs> and she said, they're mine! <laughs> and the paramedic said, she must be delirious. And so she bit him really bad. <laughs> See? <laughs> you would have liked my grandmother. She was special. Episcopal priest showed up one day. They had communion. You like this, David. And, and the priest made the big mistake after communion of stopping at the door and saying, is there anything else I can do for you, Mrs. Bush? She said, there sure is. Leave the wine. <laughs> She's good. She's neat. Lady. So I got her in this wheelchair and we're going down and a, I guess as a well-meaning activity director comes up and wanting to help and comes up behind me and says, now Mrs. Bush, you're gonna really like it here with us. Now, I think we'll just go right on down to where everybody's playing bingo. Bingo, <laughs> she says. The hell with bingo, we are not playing bingo. And she never did. I like bingo, don't worry. <laughs> Activities will not do it for me. Sorry. Maybe poker parties with some marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Wheelchair races. I don't know. You just got to get imaginative because what we got going now is not going to do it. And weekends when everybody's gone and at nighttime it's really boring. Yes, that's when most people visit, but not everybody gets visited. I worry about boredom because I think that can lead to depression and lead to me to want to end it. One night, spending the night in a nursing home with my class, uh, Arthur Moore was in my roommate, 85 years old, and we'd shared a story, and we'd gotten to know one another, and finally I, I said, Arthur, I could use some advice from an old man like you. Well, what is it? I said, my father uh, committed suicide, and I, this had to happen recently. And before I could say another word, he said, did they tell you about me? I said, Arthur, I did not mean to upset you. Well, I've tried to kill myself twice since I've been in here. Actually, it's been three times if they don't know about the third time. <laughs> he taught me a lot about life. I dedicated that book I mentioned that I wrote to my grandmother and to Arthur Moore. He died 30 days later of a uh, natural causes. He was a poor man. Uh, we had a, what do you call it, pauper. We raised money and we had a county burial. It was a great service. Ten of us. Mostly nurses' aides and me and chaplain and the activity director. It is good. So I worry about boredom. So what are we going to do about some of these maybe? Pain's the easiest. 
you got hospice providers that want to be in your home, right? Right. Um, and as part of their service, they'll do in-service education. <clears throat> and they're experts on pain management. Experts. Better than your physicians and maybe better than your medical director. And you cultivate them. And learn as much as you can and let the other staff learn about pain and how to recognize it. And get your medical director involved in these discussions. The trouble is the hospice medical director rarely sees the patient, at least in Columbia, Missouri, in most places. That's my wife's research. Uh, she's gotten over $7 million worth of National Institute on Health Research funding to, to bring the patient and the family into the interdisciplinary planning care team by video, live, real time. It's changed everything. But the, but the physician, the hospice physician is rarely in the nursing home. So what do you do? I hope you can figure that one out because there are people that know how to do this and it's not you. And so you need help. And uh, so uh, find it and don't report me when you smell smoke in my room. <laughs> Strangers, um, through homework and social histories and matchmaking, uh, you may be able to accomplish some things. Um, Plain Tree Model of Care, which was started 20 years ago in San Francisco, California, and, is, and it started in an acute care hospital. In a hospital. And if they can do this in an acute care hospital, they can do, certainly do it in a nursing home. And uh, I've been to uh, the mid-regional uh, Columbia um, Hospital on the Oregon River. What's, Columbia, what's that river called? The Columbia River? It's in the Dye, Dye, Oregon, D-A-I-S, Oregon. Been in that hospital. And uh, they have this plain tree model of care and still exists to this day. And if I know this patient's coming in next day, I find out what Stephanie's artwork is and I find out uh, what her hobbies are. And I have a whole collection of artwork and I've got this uh, in her room to be. I take down the artwork that's there that matched the interests and hobbies of the previous patient. And I, when you come, I have, let's say you love hunting, doesn't your husband love hunting, right, if I remember? You put hunting, well, that's for him. I don't know what you like. <laughs> and uh, you put all these pictures up and even the music you like, and that's all pre-planned. And so when you come, my gosh, it's like we know who you are. It just makes, you know, gotta collect the library of art that you can, you know, move around. And for health literacy, they had three patient education formats. One for someone who never went to high school, for a high school graduate, and for a college and up, upper graduate. Uh, an advanced person would get an article from the New England Journal of Medicine, for example, on his cancer. The other person might will get a much watered down version of that uh, for po out of a popular type publication. And then the, the other, the person without uh, high school education whose health literacy is limited, uh, a different kind of education. Smart. Health literacy is a big problem. Um, in um, St. Joseph, Missouri, when I was there in our uh, SNF unit, it was a 113-bed SNF unit and then a 120-bed intermediate care unit in the hospital, hospital base. Uh, I got all the staff and, you know, the relationships are between, not roommates, but staff and the resident. And so I asked which staff would be willing to become a companion, particularly the residents that got no visitors and would uh, be part of their role to visit that person uh, minimally once a day, minimally for five minutes, 
And uh, of course, what happened is people say a little longer. That got to be a little of a problem. <laughs> and uh, so I forget what we call it, the companion program. And no one was left without a companion. It worked. I don't know if it still exists. The food, I don't know. You know, the presenters yesterday said you save money with the uh, anytime menu, was it? You probably do if you keep that model. But if you change the model and, and, and uh, people can eat whenever they want, that's major cost, major. And my guess is no one here is ready to do that. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to sneak out to the local Irish pub and uh, get some pie. Uh, food's a big problem. Yeah, I just so I think maybe what you can do for me is bring in a cow with a clanging bell or something. I want to see some smiles and I want to have fun and and for heaven's sakes, get the screamer and moaner out of the room when they start. You know what I mean, right? Don't mean to put down the screamer and the moaner. But it doesn't do her or him, whoever it is, any good to stay there, nor the people that are there. On escaping, uh, If you cannot find a champion either outside the nursing home or inside the nursing home that can sponsor a transportation-like program, the best if you could put off, pull it off would get a single organization like a Rotary Club or an Optimist Club or a Kiwanis Club or whatever else civic organization is in your community because you'll have all those. And if you can find a champion in at least one of those to help organize a system of picking up people to take them out for rides. If you cannot find a champion to point, be the point person for that, in or out, then don't try it because it won't survive and it won't work. It's all about relationships and uh, there aren't many champions around because what they're doing right now inside is hard work. They don't need something on top of that. But someone on the outside, if nurtured, may do it. I helped start a, a transportation program in San Antonio, Texas. It, to this day, it still exists. The city took it over with federal money. It's called Ramparts, but it started out just out of a church. And uh, we grew from uh, private cars to buses with a small grant, and now I forget how large the fleet is. We're proud of that. But it was because uh, I championed it and then sent after me. There had to be someone. But uh, if you can't find a champion, I wouldn't uh, try any of that. On movement, uh, you're going to have more collisions, you're going to have more conflicts. Um, but you know, you have those on the outside, why not on the inside? Good old argument every now and then is okay. You can call Joy if it gets out of hand. Hey Joy, we got fisticuffs here. <laughs> we got a, one that's bleeding. But they're all laughing, they said don't bring charges. <laughs> you gotta know your people, and you do. And uh, you got to be prepared for that, and uh, there would be more wandering as you let people move in and around where they want. Um, the home I enjoyed most was when the uh, Alzheimer's uh, unit let everybody out, and there was a parade through the home. I mean a parade. And uh, I always thought that was kind of fun, because uh, people with Alzheimer's, people with dementia are just fun, you know? Once you remove the ability to, with logic, and once you remove uh, uh, the ability to interact with someone, and once you remove memory, you're left with humor and love, which pretty much are still intact, 
and expect, except during the sundowner kind of time in the afternoon, you have some moments. But for the most part, Alzheimer's, dementia patients are wonderful. If you're ever having a bad day, go back to your Alzheimer's unit and you'll just have a good old time. And I always did. So watching them go around uh, smiling and uh, with the parade sounds pretty good to me. You know, you can do some simple things. Uh, if, again, in, uh, what I did in, in uh, St. Joseph at the Heartland Health System, we developed a wheel or walk to Washington. We call it the WOW program. W-O-W, -W, wheel or walk to Washington. We had a big, huge map. And we had a, like, monopoly. Each, each resident had their icon, you know, on the map. And some people would start out walking 10 steps, you know, with a gate belt, you know, that was it. And of course, that counted as, you know, you could document that as therapy. And some people would walk uh, uh, down the whole corridor, and some people would go out. There's a way you could do a whole circle. And it depended on their ability, but by the end of that program, which, uh, which we, where we kept data six months, the uh, distances had tripled and quadrupled that people could do. The point is, though, they had fun doing it. And uh, again, it's just our imaginations. What can we come up with? On privacy, um, you do, everyone knows your residents. I know that. You know who they are. You know who, who uh, might be, gets amorous, either appropriately or inappropriately, with whomever. You know who they are. And you know uh, their habits. And unfortunately, uh, there are probably some jokes sometimes made and disrespect over that behavior. And you just need to stop that and have some really good patient education about how uh, some of that behavior may be inappropriate to you, but maybe not really. And the uh, I'm always, it's not related to sexuality, but I had a administrator who had a lot of awful jokes, racial jokes, in his facility. I mean, they were really bad. And uh, I visited one day in, in his office, and he had a picture of, this was sometime later, and had a picture of Martin Luther King on his wall. And I said, what's the story behind uh, Martin Luther King's picture? I mean, it's huge. He said, oh, I got it in a garage sale. Garage sale? Yeah. David, the racial jokes and all that were just horrible here. You just have no idea how bad they were. But you know, I got that. I, I wasn't involved in the civil rights movement or anything, but I got that picture. I put it in my office, and you know, we don't have any jokes anymore. Wow. Such role modeling. Isn't that clever? Really clever. And it worked. But again, a great example of imagination. Boredom, you know, I don't know, at admission time, it's a good, good, good a time as any to find out what people's interests and hobbies are and try to match make people and be serious about matching people up that are similar. I know changing rooms is just a headache, but doing your homework might uh, make a difference in someone's happiness. I'd conduct an inventory of the gifts and graces of all your residents. Look at them on a big chart. And, uh, Maybe that might give you some ideas. I do not know how to solve the boredom issue. And it's huge. And it might be the number one. And I want to finish by saying that uh, you want to tackle one of these, or you're already doing it, um, if it doesn't work, don't waste your time on others. You know? Pick one you think might work, see if you're successful. If you are, go for it. Let's do another one. But you don't have much time for me. 
got to get busy. And then it's not just me you need to think about. As I said on this clip, uh, it's the caregiver. Caregivers suffer far more. Listening to my wife cry at 3 in the morning when she thinks I'm asleep is horrible. And she's strong. She's so strong she can fire people and not worry about it. <laughs> Caregivers out in the public can't say anything. In my case, for example, I've learned that if Stephanie's my caregiver and she starts talking about her own pain, <coughs> People might think wrongly about her. Oh, she's so selfish. Listen to her. My God, he's the one that's dying. <coughs> and so they stay tight-lipped, these caregivers. And they don't talk about it. But they hurt. And the caregiver's stress is huge, leading to its own kind of illness and chronic problems, particularly if it's an elderly person taking care of another elderly person. I was smart, my wife's 18 years younger than me. <laughs> which forces me to buy all that expensive Viagra. <laughs> so you need to take care sometimes of the caregiver, as well as the resident, okay? And I'll close by saying that when it's all said and done, I really want two things from you. That is easy, but you got to work at it. I want you to be honest with me, and I want you to accept me the way I am. I don't you notice my picture on there. I couldn't believe how I look like a Buddha. <laughs> and that was from the steroids. That was from the chemo. Oh, my God. And my hair looked pretty good. <laughs> and uh, just be honest with me and accept me. It's like little kids, you know, that come into your facility. Little six-year-olds, you know, all your residents get, oh, start, not all of them, <laughs> but most of them smile, come hug me, you know, oh, come over here, honey. And they get animated. It's just fun to watch. And, Little six-year-old, you know, come over here. What's that tube stuck up your body? <laughs> what Art Linkletter say once about kids? Say the darndest things. Kids say the darndest things. The woman says to him, honey, that's my pee. Your pee? Oh, Mary, Mary, come here. Look at this woman's pee. <laughs> now, if you can't laugh at that, you've really got problems. <laughs> Urine is a medical term, okay? Pee is a family term. <laughs> you know, urine is something you get a specimen of. Pee is something you gotta. <laughs> my guess is most of you gotta right now after <laughs> this talk. So I wish you the best. I respect you. I love you. And I'm here because I love you. unloaded all this <laughs> uh, and you'll learn a little bit about cancer I guess uh, the uh, I got this incurable thing that that uh, will come back okay so I know that it's but when is the question the chemo did work and I never thought it would because in my generation you get cancer it's a death sentence and chemo was never that sure thing and by golly, there are a lot of cancers that chemo does lead to remission. So I'm become, and the chemo has shrunk my cancer. So much so, the last two PET scans 
have been what they call clear. And what clear means is that the PET scan can't uh, see uh, the cancer cells because they're smaller than a centimeter. centimeter. They can't uh, see that small. And I've had two scans like that. The first one, they wanted to do still another treatment to make, get it shrunk, you know, if it's shrinking it, obviously, get it as small as possible. Uh, but this cancer is an insidious, crazy, cunning, baffling thing, and who knows what's going to happen. But June the 5th, uh, I will have my first PET scan in three months rather than every six weeks, like I've been having them. And uh, so June 5th is kind of a nervous day for me, so you can be thinking about me on June 5th. Because uh, we'll have the PET scan. If the cancer has returned, and worse if it's spread to other places. Uh, I will not do, uh, I've already decided. Five months of chemo is not worth three months of life. You know, I've enjoyed this trip, but you know, <laughs> paid a hell of a price to be here today. Uh, <coughs> chemo is not fun. And uh, I don't want to go through it. And the second round of chemo is just not as effective as the first round anyway. So, but if I'm lucky and you hear, and Bob, you know, we'll keep you posted, right? Because evidently you've sent a lot of this to people. Thanks. Uh, if it's still clear, then I get three more months, okay, before I have another scan. And at some point it will show up. And the, in the interview here, that was early on, and uh, three to five years has been reduced to six to 12 months, I've been told. That they, Oncologists think it'll come back in six to 12 months. If it's 12 months, hallelujah, that means I would probably then do the chemo again, because it worked the first time. Drugs work on my body. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not offending anybody, but it is good, you know? <laughs> and you know, I really don't care if I offend you. <laughs> no, that, I'm sorry, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I hope it's clear and uh, things are good and in two weeks I go, before you start feeling sorry for me, uh, I, uh, two weeks, I, eight days, I go to uh, Rome, Italy for a week with my wife and uh, my oldest son and his family and two grandchildren, 18 and 13, and then we're going on an 11-day cruise to Istanbul because that's on my bucket list, I got a short bucket list. And I'm going to really have a good time doing that. And uh, I reached my 70th birthday, April 2nd. I didn't think I would. And so uh, I'm doing pretty good for 70, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so if uh, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I will be at your uh, fall conference or your spring conference next year. Great. Let's go for the spring yeah. conference. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Ah, the handouts are on the table by Joy. See them, Joy, there in the middle. And the back page is that blog that you can find all those videos we've done, and you can watch future ones if you follow that blog site. And uh, enjoy. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are.